Hello, my name is Alexander Kerry. Welcome to the program. The demolition of the monument dedicated to Vladimir Lenin was a symbolic moment during the Euromaidan protest in Kiev back in 2013. Over the winter months leading up to 2014 Ukrainian Revolution, hundreds of other Lenin statues were toppled or removed as the country attempted to move away from its Soviet past. But what exactly happened to them? Photographer Neil Sarkerman and journalist Sebastian Gobert joined forces in a project called Looking for Lenin, tracking down the path of disappeared Lenins across around Ukraine. And a photo book also called Looking for Lenin has just been released. So let's uh, first become, be, begin by uh, the decommunization. So is decommunization a way to, to erase history or to make it disappear? Well, I mean, decommunization is a way for Ukrainians to, you know, appropriate and to understand their history in a very different way. Something that has been implemented <clears throat> in other Soviet, uh, post-Soviet republics and, and other uh, communist countries in Central Europe, and that Ukraine has decided to implement in a very radical way uh, 25 years after its, uh, its independence. The thing is that uh, what we understood doing this project and the findings that we present uh, in, in, in this book is that it raises as many questions as it tries to solve in the sense that this is really an open process, this is really an uh, undecided issue. The way Ukrainians understand their history, the way they want to project, project, them, project themselves so uh, in, in the future. While, while taking off those symbols? Well. Uh, as, as you know, I mean, Ukraine has attempted to define itself as an independent state and uh, the communist heritage and the Lenin statues for that, uh, for that matter are perceived as uh, some kind of colonial heritage from the USSR, a symbol of uh, dependence and so on and so on. So uh, for, for quite many Ukrainians, it was, it's very important to get rid of these symbols and to make them disappear from the public space. So on an um, on aesthetic uh, point of view, the symbol of the, of the statue is very important. Everybody has in mind, of course, the, 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 fallen, the fall of, of Lenin's statue and then also the, the fall of uh, Saddam Hussein's statues. Yeah. Why would you say that those statues are that important in uh, mythology, in the, in the image of, of uh, the conscious of people? It's, as a Westerner, uh, like all the, the Soviet imagery is really, like, for me, it was the main attraction point to the East. Uh, my first trips to Ukraine, first I, my goal was to go to Russia. I was fascinated by all the Soviet time iconography, uh, the simplistic design, but still yet very strong, catchy, catchy images, so, catchy architecture. So, so, so <coughs> and, realism. So, yeah, so exactly. Realism. All of that attracted me a lot. And uh, I decided to go to Ukraine instead of Russia because there was no visa needed. But yeah, it was my first attraction. And f I think for many Westerners, uh, consciously or not, when they come to Ukraine, what they want to see is uh, the remnants of this uh, Soviet time. And um, when you, you can see, or if you go, for example, on Andrei Skispusk and you, you look at what is uh, sold, mm. uh, it's T-shirts with Lenin's head, it's uh, these bursts yeah, and stuff. Yeah, there, there is still and these memories around, this yeah. iconography around. It's a bit sad, it's a bit sad for the contemporary culture and uh, as uh, as a friend of uh, Ukrainian uh, contemporary culture, I'm always a bit saddened to see friends or tourists coming home with uh, uh, all these Soviet. Uh, why, is, why, why, why that? Because it's become it's became a pop culture thing, or because it's just so full of charge, or full of symbol. It's, of the it's still Hirschfeld quite a symbols. shortcut uh, yeah. for for me. It's, uh, outside of all the positive or negative aspect of it, it's a shortcut and it's very reductive to, to say, yeah, Ukraine was part of USSR, so let's just only consider it like that. Um, what, we can sh what we show through this project that we did uh, is that actually it's much more, and it, it's fun, we didn't expect that, but we were just looking for these statues, and each of them is a different situation. We have 70 different statues in our book, but uh, no, no, not a single one is similar to another. They all have a different story, they all have a different background, uh, they're in different situations, different um, conditions, and all of that says things about the rule of law in Ukraine, about uh, the resources, about the relationship to, to this past. So it's some a support, support to see another, <coughs> another way of seeing Ukraine and the diversity in some sort of way. The, idea, the, of the idea was to say the history of contemporary Ukraine uh, between the lines by showing the end of this era and or um, continuity. 
Mm. And um, that's the, that was the because the, if you just look at the image, it could look fun. But that's why it was really important to do it together with Sebastian because all the testimonies that are brought help the reader to understand uh, the complexity of contemporary yeah. Ukraine, all the nuances. Because it's not it's not only a photo book. Yeah, of course. If I, if I may add up on yeah. on that, I mean, like <clears throat> there is one 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 reason why it's uh, a bit sad, you know, to consider this uh, this fascination for Lenin because these this is a symbol of a totalitarian regime and we all know about the crimes of communism about uh, the crimes of the of the of the Soviet regime and there are quite many reasons for Ukrainians to make these symbols disappear from the public space but uh, also we understand that this regime has lasted for 70 years and there were different periods there were periods of repression there were periods of you know cooling down there were periods of prosperity and everything so we also understand why many ukrainians want to keep these symbols and want to you know use them either on on the rivsky uzvis or at home or in the city or or so on so this is something that we really wanted to show in this book we don't judge we don't have any particular opinion as to whether the communization is good or bad but we want to provide a panorama uh, of the of the situation and to explain why uh, the communization and the Lenin fall uh, are really uh, undecided issues and why it's still very divisive today in Ukraine yeah because behind the history there are stories there are the stories of, of, of people who took the statue so my, my next question will be first is it legal like let's say tomorrow i want to have a lenin in my backyard which i need like of course a big backyard but of course it's like how how do i how do i get this uh how do i how do, do these statues mm -hmm. comes from pedestals to backyards or 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 uh i don't know closets or so first you can have a lenin in your backyard if you want as long as you don't put it in the public space and as as long as you don't use it in a way to promote the communist ideology uh, the way to get the statue, you have to uh, you have to be clever and you have to be to be lucky also. But you have to consider that uh, back in 1989, when the first Lenin started to fall, even before the the, the collapse of the USSR, there were 5,500 uh, Lenin statues uh, erected uh, across the Ukrainian territory. It was the highest density of Lenin statues in uh, in, the, uh, in USSR, even in the world. Yeah, in the, in the world, actually, yeah. Even, even in, in Soviet Russia, the density of Lenin was not, uh, was not that high. It was 20, 22 times lower, yeah. just to, to yeah. give you a, an impression. So why, why, why Ukraine? So, why, why so much so many in Ukraine? Well, I mean, and the, just what I, what I wanted yeah, to say yeah. is that you have Lenin everywhere, mm. even now. And as we know, you know, the decommunization dates back to 2015. So uh, it's still very fresh and you still have quite a lot of Lenin everywhere. So if you want to get one, you can get one. Just be careful with the way you use it. Uh, as, to, as to why so many Lenin, maybe you want to? Uh, just to finish in, with this, because we saw many kind of uh, uh, end usage of uh, these Lenins, some in backyards, some, many are stored in public and uh, municipal territories, because still these things belong officially to the local municipalities and we saw sometimes them coming back there. Mm. For example, uh, in Chernihiv, uh, the statue was stolen. The guy who stole it uh, wanted to sell the metal and with the money officially he said he wanted to buy a new statue to the city. But the city came back and uh, took the, the pieces of the, the, the statue was already cut into pieces and they took, uh, they took the pieces back and now they are storing them somewhere. And that's also where the problem happens, because uh, there are so many different levels of uh, decision that uh, it's very hard to know exactly where is the ownership and uh, who can take the decision to, for example, sell the metal to bring budget to the, the, the city or uh, like yeah, taking any decision to, to sell it, to transform it, to use it. And uh, now it creates a lot of uh, uncertainty that we saw in many municipalities where they're like, we have this, but we don't, don't know. know we do don't know yet if, if we can yeah. do it something. If we can do something out of it or not, and uh, that creates a, a lot of um, of trouble, yeah. which also favors then uh, disappearing. Uh, some so of the th biggest Lenins so got so stolen. So would you say there is, um, to a certain extent, not a black market, but some some spiral circuits around around these these, these statues? Of course, but there are many black markets in Ukraine. <laughs> But just to Lenin give is just one of them. the most emblematic example, it was the, the beginning of our quest, you mentioned it in the, in the beginning, 
Bessarabska Lenin, the one that was on, on Bessarabska Square, uh, made out of a precious stone because it was the, the same uh, quartzite as the mausoleum in, in Moscow for, for Lenin. Uh, and when this monument fell, everybody was trying to break it into pieces. They took only fragments, but a big block was still uh, left. And it was the, really our first goal to find out, find out where, the rest did, of the... where is the rest of this. And uh, the city had no idea. Most of the journalists had no idea. Actually, nobody had any idea until we, st we found who stole the, what was left. And uh, it, it, we still we saw some pictures of what it looks like, but we still couldn't actually see the the, the statue. We mention it in the uh, in the book. We found some fragments, like the head, the hand, uh, but we couldn't see by ourselves mm. and photograph by ourselves uh, what is left of this Bessarabska Lenin. And uh, it, I, I mean, it's Kiev. It's <laughs> it's uh, one of the the most emblematic statue. It was the beginning of this movement, and uh, and it's and it's a big uh, big public property that is stolen. We, so, as, as you said, uh, those Lenins are everywhere in, in Ukraine now. And as I understand this book, it's also some sort of, of a road trip through, through Ukraine, across, across Ukraine. Did this travel change your views on Ukraine and on Ukrainians? in some sort of way. Well, I've been here for a long time, so it didn't really change, uh, I mean, my, my views of Ukraine, my understanding of the country. Uh, of course, I discovered many things. I, I, I met many more, uh, many more people. Uh, it, it, really, it didn't really change my view of Ukraine, but it changed my vision uh, of decommunization, and it really helped me understanding uh, mm. why is this issue, why is history so alive in Ukraine? This is one of the places in, uh, in, in, in Europe where history is really alive. And we still see consequences uh, of that today, of course, with the toppling of the, of, the, um, of the monuments, but also with the renaming of the streets, uh, with the, yeah, the, 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 the ninth of May ceremonies and so on, and so on, and so on. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm. so it really helped me to, uh, to understand Niels, Niels all of that. To, to, yeah. 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 I was really touched when, when we were working on this because we were traveling together, mm. uh, we, we did tens of thousands of kilometers throughout the, uh, the country to, uh, to find these, uh, these statues. And Sebastian was gathering stories, but he was still pretty secretive on what he would do, what would come out of it. And uh, when I had the first opportunity to read the different testimonies that he gathered, and mm -hmm. in the book they're put in a way... We're going to show I, it on yeah, screen. On, we we, on can, see, we screen. can see, but for example, like you have pictures, and yes. after some pictures, so here there are some, after some pictures, you have um, you have the whole the whole testimonies of, of, of you have like yeah double pages and there they come all of over the, the book of, 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 of different histories yeah. and what is what was really catchy for me is that you read the first story and you think whatever the person says you think well this person is quite um, honest and uh, mm. I, I I could share um, the conclusions of this person uh, this person is is quite right in her own way. You read the second person and you think the same. Third one, exactly also like, yeah, it could be me. And then you, you look a bit further and you realize that they say exactly opposite things. And, and, and there's a whole... <laughs> okay, yeah, so, for, for, so. for me, the, like, all these little texts, it's like a little brick and all together it builds like a, a block, a house of uh, like a very... Um, uh, nuanced vision yeah. of the situation, and it's really part so, of our yeah, goal it's not also to looking judge. for the truth in some sort of, in some sort of ways. It's like ad there's, there's, no the there's no truth. There's no exposing the truth from the reality. You know, the, the Ukraine. Well, in the context of the revolution, of the war, uh, of the war on information, this is one of the places where one reality develops uh, different truths. And this is also what happens in this book with uh, the toppling of the monument from one act, from one monument, from one event, you have different visions, you have different truth, different interpreta in interpretation of history. And this is, this is what we wanted to show, like how complex, how complex this is. So more, more than a journalistic and more than a witnessing and a, than a road trip, there's also this artistic uh, kind of kind of uh, uh, quest, if I if I do understand, and as I understand, it's a work in progress. And you're also working with this platform called uh, Isolatia, who was in Donetsk, who used to be in Donetsk, and who is now uh, in Kiev, who's a young young platform. So I have two questions here. Why would you think that civil society, young people in the civil society, are so much interested 
into, uh, into that, kind of, uh, that kind of, of initiative. So that's, that's going to be first. And uh, the other is what's next. Mm. <laughs> well, civil society is interested in everything that happens in Ukraine. And this is something that we have seen at the time of the Maidan, 2014, and it's really like going on because they have the feeling that the state doesn't take good care of the country, at not good enough, and that they have to step in and they have to do something. And it also, uh, it's also true with the history and with the uh, cultural heritage. So you have all of these young activists who really <laughs> develop, you know, some kind of expertise on Lenin, who d really uh, develop some kind of expertise on the, on the, on the mosaics and try to find uh, a meaning to what is happening. Because for these young activists who were born either in the late 80s or, you know, in the 90s, like this is this is totally they new. They didn't go through USSR. Yeah, so they, they were born when USSR was they, collapsing. They yeah. are they are the generation of independent Ukraine. So they are building themselves as personalities at the same time as uh, Ukraine builds its independence. And this is also why they, they feel so involved. You know they, why why they feel so connected to to everything that uh, that's happening now. This is this is really remarkable. And so our cooper, co our cooperation with uh, Isolatia in that respect has been extremely fruitful. And uh, just to add something also about like the, the role, uh, seeing a big involvement of civil society in questions like uh, how to deal with your cultural heritage, uh, it's especially important in a situation like that because uh, the more open, the more inclusive uh, are the, the discussions about like, what to do with our past, uh, the more efficiently you can fight against uh, totalitarian ideas. It's not by having a highly centralized decision process that you can promote more democracy, more uh, including um, society. Mm. And uh, coming from Switzerland, for me, it's, uh, it's an especially important thing to, to be like, maybe having a longer, slower process, but a very inclusive one where you hear those who are for, those who are against, and you, you consider all the, all the positions. And that's like, by, by, with our small contribution to it, we just try to show uh, all the complexity, all the spectrum of the, the opinions and, uh, and yeah, give it as a, as a tool for, for people to, to understand that there is no easy answer to this and uh, the more inclusive, the better will be the, the answer. Yeah, because well. the, we, we did hear the critics of, uh, uh, you know, some people considering the decommunization process done in a very brutal and authoritarian way. Someone uh, who, is, uh, who, who is working at the Kiev municipality actually told us mm. that decommunization is made with communist methods mm. in the sense that you just have a list of monuments to topple, you just don't think about it, you yeah. don't consult with the local population, boom. So, that, that's, so that's where your project comes in to make, under, to make understand, to have a, like a some sort of a broader, uh, broader and, perspective. And to document the process, to document the process. And to give back history where history is. Basically. Well, okay. I mean, <laughs> trying to, to you, try. ta you, ta you take whatever you want out of our work. <laughs> yeah. We did our best. Okay. <laughs> well, thank you, thank you very much for this interview. It was a, it was a pleasure to have you uh, in the studio. Uh, that was uh, Sebastian Gobert <clears throat> and Neil Sarkerman uh, presenting their new book, Looking for Lenin. Thank you for watching the program. Stay tuned for the rest. <laughs> <laughs>